So in this lecture, we're going to try to talk more about constraints. What uh, type of constraints do we have to deal with? Um, how do we define them? How do we impose them? And so forth. Um, even though this is a full lecture that may take uh, uh, 40 minutes or so, um, <clears throat> it's still an overview and an introduction to constraints and their use. You, you really learn about them <clears throat> once you have your own model and you're imposing them and, and determining their consequences. Okay, so we're going to talk about a few things. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, remind us of the fact that the cell is crowded and a lot of interconnections are happening inside the cell. And that has a lot of constraints associated with it. We'll talk a little bit about stating uh, and imposing constraints. I mentioned this a little bit before, but we'll uh, say some more about that topic now. Uh, capacity constraints are extremely important. <clears throat> and uh, just briefly, uh, um, in a cubic micron, you know, the, the volume of a mitochondria or a bacterial cell, there's not a lot of space, but you have a lot of components that have to be packed into it. So there are space constraints. Cells are very crowded. And the same thing is true with biological membranes. <clears throat> there are a few chemical constraints that we uh, need to talk about because these are nice. These you can describe with equations and you can impose them. So there are the flux balances or mass conservation. There is element, uh, conservation of elements. There are thermodynamics. And we can now put label through a, a network where we just put uh, uh, a nucleus, an isotope in a particular location in a molecule and watch it go through the network. And by seeing where it ends up, you can learn a lot about the state of your network and its properties. So that's the use of you know, isotopes to uh, look at the uh, at chemistry. So we'll talk a little bit about that. The regulatory constraints, uh, discuss those a little bit. And at the end, we'll talk about coupling constraints. And this relates to uh, the hierarchical organization of biology. You can have a model at one layer uh, in the hierarchy and another one at the a higher level, but they have to couple together. They actually have mutually constraining function. And that's kind of embedded in that uh, quote to uh, Paul Nurse that we had in the last lecture. Namely, that uh, it's likely that the lower level in a biological hi hierarchy is informative about the upper level and vice versa, because they have to be coupled together. Okay, so first, let's just take a look at a cell. Here is one of these images that I've been showing before, and a little uh, zoom in in a part of it. That looks pretty crowded. You know, that's like uh, trying to uh, go through, you know, I don't know if you ever tried to, uh, to walk through a crowded nightclub, <laughs> say. I mean, you cannot just run across the room. You bunch in, you run into a whole bunch of people, you can't move across the room very fast. The same thing is with a molecule inside the cell. There are so many things in your way. Diffusion inside the cell, particularly of macromolecules, is really st stinted. Small molecules diffuse pretty easily around inside cells, as it turns out. So about 30% of the volume in there is stuff, some stuff, and there is 70% water. And that, oddly enough, is kind of constant in almost uh, uh, um, all cells. There are a few marine organisms that may have a little bit more water content, but by and large, it's almost over 70%. If you look at the organization of eukaryotic cells, <clears throat> you see a lot of membranes that are compartmentalizing the cell. And inside every compartment, different things happen. So a lot of lipid layers uh, in eukaryotic cells. And the area of those uh, compartments uh, carry protein and transporters and so forth. And there's only so much space in those membranes. And there's only so much protein you can stuff into these membranes. So there is a constraint based on the capacity of proteins uh, to carry uh, ca ca capacity of membranes to carry protein. So uh, uh, the biophysical view of a cell says there are a lot of constraints based on uh, capacities that like I was talking about. We've of course have talked about networks uh, and the network constraints uh, uh, through flux balances and so forth. And then there are the hierarchical constraints. Um, so these are three different categories of constraints. And a little bit more about hierarchical constraints. This is a really nice little two page reference uh, in cell, it's interesting to read, and it talks about the hierarchical organization of cells in uh, space, in size of objects, in time, everything unfolds on, on different time scales, and also abundances, 
So, so like, uh, you know, a molecule is uh, less than a nanometer uh, in size, glucose and so forth are really small. Uh, a retrovirus may be 50 to 100 nanometers. A cell may be a micron bacterial cell, eukaryotic cells, 10 microns, and so forth. So it's a well-defined size hierarchy that I think everybody in biology or in the life sciences needs to be cognizant of and just know what these quantities are. Uh, same thing with uh, time, uh, and same thing with abundances. Uh, some molecules inside the cell are, are very few, it's maybe just a handful of transcription factors, for instance, needed to carry out the function, but the abundance of ATP would be very high because that's the energy currency of a cell. So there's a spectrum or a distribution of abundances. So all these things uh, are a part of uh, the hierarchical organization of cells. Okay, so <clears throat> stating and imposing constraints. We talked a little bit about this last time in an abstract way when we walked through that image to the top right. Let's talk about a specific example here. So this is a specific example that shows how you impose constraints. So there are a few steps in this process illustrated here. Uh, to the far, far left, we have a network that's reconstructed and it's very simple, <laughs> a split there of A into B and C and then B and C react. And down below, I have these sliders that will tell you what are the, what are the allowable reaction fluxes uh, in that network. And if you just have a topology of a network, it's completely uninformative about what these flux states are. It doesn't tell you anything about what those are. So in the second column, I show the imposition of uh, thermodynamics that says that the uh, first and last reaction are irreversible. Then all of a sudden, all the flux states that have negative values on those fluxes are gone. And now these arrows uh, or these lines are not infinite in both directions. But they start from zero and go up. And then we have in the third uh, column, we have now imposition of the maximum fluxes. And now these become line segments. And the fluxes have to be in that uh, line segment. And then in this case, the fourth constraints imposed is as we are in a steady state and we have to balance the fluxes. And now you see that uh, these lines uh, get even shorter. And then finally, on the very last one, we say that we have the kinetics fully. And if you have them fully and on genome scale, maybe you can get closer to defining a point. But this is just an example of how you successively impose constraints and the uh, range of allowable states, allowable functional states, keeps going down and down and down. Then, I should remind you of uh, the existence of redundant and dominant constraints. We talked about this before uh, in uh, the lecture on pathways, um, where we saw that one constraint, say in this case, the constraint on the input into that node, can either be redundant if it's more relaxed than the constraints on the outputs, or it can be dominant if it's so constraining that it's always below the constraints of the exiting reactions. And this is pretty important in um, uh, constraint-based thinking because you always want to find the constraints that constrain the space the most. And even if you can get other constraints, if they're all redundant, you don't care anymore. So it's very important to try to figure out what is most constraining on a network. But be mindful of the fact that the relative importance of constraints changes with conditions. Like I said, they can be dominant or redundant. So for instance, as I mentioned before, you know, case A may represent normal genetics A, and if somebody has an inborn error in a function, all of a sudden they have C, and that will eliminate, uh, represented, represented by that line C, then all of a sudden there's a bunch of physiological functions they can't have because of that problem. Okay, capacity constraints. So I already mentioned uh, this before. Membranes have a limited ability to carry protein. And we know that. They're typically about 30, 40% of the area of a membrane is protein. And the rest is the bilipid layer. And that's kind of the capacity of membranes to carry protein. And in the top uh, right there is an image from a paper that was trying to calculate the relative occupancy of glucose importers, ETS components, and metabolic byproduct, byproduct exporters in the membrane of E. coli. Because you have a fixed membrane, you have fixed activity of each one of those, 
and you have to place them all in the membrane. And given their activity states and the, the uh, need to, to balance those activity states, you have to divvy up that space in a certain way. You cannot just package any amount of component in there. And of course, as we know, for some organelles, this is really a huge constraint. <clears throat> and in the mitochondria, the inner membrane is pleated. I mean, it's like really uh, folded. So the surface per volume uh, ratio for the inner membrane in the mitochondria is very high. Um, and interestingly enough, the additional uh, 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 protein in the ATP complex in eukaryotes fold the membrane. Those components are not found in, in bacteria because they work with, by and large, with flat uh, membranes, not always the true. And of course, the chloroplast does the same uh, with, the, uh, uh, with photosynthesis. So this actually offers up a lot of opportunity to calculate things. You can calculate ahead of times and estimate many of these constraints uh, uh, <clears throat> by doing back of the envelope calculations. I'm just gonna do a couple of them with you here. So let's try to estimate, <clears throat> and we have, I think in this case, we're looking at uh, E. coli growing um, uh, aerobically. How much ATP synthase does it have to express and place in its membrane? And what are the consequences of that? You can calculate this very quickly. So there's a lot of data on ATP synthase, <clears throat> and there is kinetic data that says that it does uh, um, whatever that number is, 230 revolutions <coughs> per uh, second, and every revolution uh, of the uh, core of the uh, ATP synthase will make three ATP molecules. So you can calculate how many ATP molecules can be made by a synthase in an hour. Because I choose an hour because that's roughly the cell division time. So about two and a half million ATPs can be produced by every complex in an hour, which is roughly the division time of E. coli under you know, reasonably rich nutrient conditions. Now we can estimate um, <clears throat> from the genome scale models, uh, just based on flux map balancing, how much ATP we need to generate to compute, to, to synthesize a whole cell. And not to belabor this in too much detail here, but the answer is given there. We have about, uh, let's see, that's a million, it's about eight, it's a little under nine billion ATP molecules we need, like nine times 10 to the ninth, roughly, ATP molecules we need to build a new E. coli cell. <clears throat> and that's a calculation uh, from a flux balance model. So you can ratio those two numbers and you get, what, 3,500 um, ATP synthase complexes you need to have in the membrane of an actively growing E. coli cell, uh, <clears throat> working basically at Vmax, top speed. So since they're not all at Vmax, you may need a, a few more. Now, <clears throat> the ability to carry a membrane protein in E. coli is about uh, 200,000 molecules uh, in the membrane. Uh, and that's based on 30, 40 percent just uh, area coverage of an average membrane protein. The ATP synthase, of course, is a huge footprint in the membrane because it's big. In fact, it's comprised of about 22 protein. And if you estimate the area, actually, you, there are electron micrographs of the ATP synthase. You can see what its area is. And you can estimate what fraction of that membrane proteome it needs to occupy to generate those uh, 9 billion ATP molecules, and the answer comes out to be about 40% of the proteome in the inner membrane. That is 40% of the whole area. So, so maybe 15, 16% of the membrane area has to be occupied by uh, ATP synthase. And you can do similar calculations for the other ETS components and the transporters and so forth, and you will see that they, they will share, they will take up the lion's share of the protein loading capacity of the inner membrane in E. coli. So you can calculate things like this very quickly. You can get minimally order of magnitude estimate of, uh, of many uh, processes uh, in the cell. In um, the undergraduate class we teach, uh, we actually uh, uh, escalate this up into a rough spreadsheet that calculates roughly what all of the processes in the cell and a rapidly growing E. coli cell have to be doing simultaneously at the same time. So this is not so hard <coughs> to do. So constraints can be cons <coughs> conceptual, but you can attach numbers to them pretty quickly. So here's another calculation that I'm not going to detail either, <coughs> but you can calculate what the average metabolite concentration in a cell needs to be. 
It occupies about 1%, metabolism, metabolites occupy about 1% to 2% of the total volume of a cell. Uh, like I said, the 70% water, about 30% biomass, most of that is protein, about half, and so forth. But about 1% of the space, uh, or 2% of the space or so, is in metabolites. So you can easily calculate what it takes, <coughs> uh, what, what, you know, so they have to share that space, and you can calculate the average concentration of metabolites. That's done there for a thousand metabolites roughly. That is the average molecular weight and you can calculate this out and you get <clears throat> uh, a few tenths of micromolar. And when you start looking at data, a, a lot of the uh, metabolites are in the 10 to 100 micromolar range. Few of them are much higher, few of them like B12 will be much lower, but most of them are in this range. Uh, and it's kind of interesting <clears throat> that you can uh, take this calculation a little further because a reference volume is typically a cubic micron. You know, you're looking at the mitochondria, like I said, or, or a bacterial cell and so forth. So a cubic micron is a very useful uh, reference volume. And if you ask yourself how many molecules are in one cubic micron at one micromolar concentration, and the answer is 600 molecules. So if you multiply that by 32 or so, uh, you figure out that <clears throat> there are only uh, about 20,000 or so, maybe 25,000 uh, molecules of every metabolite in that volume. So that's a tiny number. That's absolutely a tiny number. And of course, this is the reason why uh, enzymes have to be so efficient, so you can get generate any kind of reaction rate uh, at those concentrations. And often there are some complexes and they never let the uh, metabolites go. You just hand them from one protein to the next to the next, the phenomena called channeling. Okay, kinetic constants are a little harder to get based on fundamental considerations. <clears throat> uh, we can calculate uh, a few things based on a collision, a maximum collision frequency, so you can get an upper bound. This is a nice paper come from Ron uh, Milo's lab uh, uh, in Israel, and uh, they have involved in um, putting together something like the uh, bio number website at Harvard, tried to catalog typical numbers for biology, and he has generated uh, papers and websites and so forth that are very useful to go to to pick out what the numbers might be. So the middle diagram here is kind of interesting, that uh, orange swath or reddish swath that goes down to the right of that represent diffusional limitations, so those are the maximum enzymatic reaction rates you can get. And you see enzymes like uh, superoxide dismutation there and so forth, enzymes that really have to operate at a high level. But many uh, of the kinetic constants are below that, and they are selected for based on evolutionary needs, as we talked about. And sometimes the enzymes that have less <coughs> demand on their kinetic capability may become promiscuous and have ability to carry out many different reactions because they are not forced to be so specialized and Nate Lewis might talk about that when he's here next time. A little bit about um, diffusional restrictions uh, uh, inside cells. We talked about the crowding effect, <clears throat> and certainly um, diffusion of macromolecules is very restricted inside cells. They cannot move uh, around freely, and the estimation for protein is that their diffusion coefficients inside the cell are maybe 10 to 100 times lower than that in free solution. But it turns out with uh, <clears throat> metabolites in, you know, in a 70% uh, void fraction, say, uh, uh, solution, where there's 30% stuff <coughs> and 70% water um, at 37 degrees or so, uh, the diffusion rate is large enough uh, <coughs> so that over a micron distance, the kind of distance of interest to us, uh, they can diffuse pretty freely and quickly, and uh, uh, the concentration of small molecules seem to be pretty uniform inside cells, whereas uh, macromolecules are not. And that's a pretty important uh, realization because if you build kinetic models of metabolism, you can assume a homogeneity, which you cannot do for protein. Now it's interesting, here's another estimate. <coughs> um, which uh, uh, has uh, stood the uh, test of time. So here is an association step in uh, enzymatically catalyzed reaction where you have a substrate and an enzyme binding. So this is the binding step, which is normally very fast. The release step is normally slower. 
So we have estimates of these typical substrate concentration, and we can get estimates of the enzyme concentrations too. And we can get an estimate for that association rate based on collision frequency, just what is the maximum uh, rate of getting uh, that reaction to go. And if you calculate that out, you get about a million molecules can be converted by an enzyme per cubic micron per second. And this is a very interesting number because the uh, pathway is clocked at maximum rate, like glycolysis in the liver, say, or in the brain, or the kidney, or, or rapidly growing E. coli, is just about that number. It's maybe 800,000 to a million. So this is, you can, in other words, you can impose a global upper bound on those pathways based on these considerations. And that can be nice to have. So I have, somehow, for some reason, I remembered this number <laughs> since it was calculated. One million molecules per cubic micron per second. That is the flux that cells have to live with. For some pathways, of course, it's much lower than that, but that would be the upper bound. So there's another important constraint on membrane, uh, on, on membrane function. <clears throat> we talked about the crowding of them but they also can only carry a certain uh, a potential. And it turns out that, uh, let me see here, that um, uh, uh, I should just, I think, let me just put all these bullet points up. It turns out that just physically, um, a bilipid layer destabilizes when you put more than 280 milliwatt charge on it. It just cannot physically withstand uh, a higher potential than that. Uh, most uh, energy transducing membranes, and that paper may be a little uh, difficult to read because of the small numbers, but most energy transducing membranes inside cells are charged to about 200, 220 millivolts. So heavily charged towards the 280, but at a safe distance away so that they won't uh, depolarize and you know, just fall apart, just physically disintegrate. So when, you do, so, you, so when you do these order of magnitude calculations, it's often useful to put this in context of our experience at our you know, length scale and time scale. If you take the width of a bilipid layer, that's about seven nanometers, and that's another number that's kind of good to remember, um, and you take uh, 220 millivolts across it, and you change the units into volts per centimeter, which is maybe what we would be familiar with, centimeter like that, that number turns out to be 300,000 volts per centimeter. That's what that charge is, but of course it's a tiny little uh, distance. If you take a lighter and you, and you generate a spark, if you flip that, uh, I think uh, air is destabilizes at about 1,000 volts per centimeter. So that's how a lighter you know, generates a spark. So this is two orders, two or three orders of magnitude above that. So these members are ex incredibly heavily charged. So that's another constraint that is basically biophysical in nature. Okay, so let me run through a, a few constraints associated with chemistry. This one we're not going to spend much time on here, but it was just the flux balance equations. We'll go through this in much more detail uh, later on. But mass uh, cannot come out of the blue. Uh, it has to be balanced uh, in its origin and its destination as we flow through networks. And these are a very uh, constraining set of equations we'll talk about. You can estimate the thermodynamic properties of many reactions inside cells, and uh, it appears that the estimators for this are getting better and better. I uh, mentioned Ron Milo's lab in Israel. I believe he's the one that has the equilibrator, equilibrator uh, uh, software on his website that calculates the uh, equilibrium constants. Uh, there are so resources that uh, are being developed uh, to look at those. And of course, if a reaction is exothermic, uh, you won't expect it to go in the forward uh, direction, and you think that it is uh, uh, irreversible in the other direction. The floxomic tracers, um, I talked about those. Um, so for instance, in the panel A here, you might have uh, labeled uh, the orange looking spot. That molecule goes into metabolism and splits into two and will come out on that uh, C2 moiety. So you can trace uh, you know, where that uh, molecule, uh, where that atom goes. The equations associated with this are very complicated. You have to put a bunch of uh, what are called uh, uh, equations associated with atomic mapping matrices. 
because every atom in one compound gets mapped onto an atom in another compound um, that the relates the, the uh, product, uh, the reactant of a, of a reaction to its products. So these become quite complicated, but if you have the uh, abundance, the isotopomeric abundance of molecules uh, throughout metabolism uh, and, and what gets secreted as a function of the label going in, you can constrain uh, the allowable fluxes uh, significantly. Very mathematical subject and normally difficult to deal with, but productive in many cases. So regulation, um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. We already mentioned this a few times, so we won't say much about that. So there is a, I would say we won't detail this here now. Um, here is a solution space, a four-sided cone with four extreme pathways. And as we talked about, we can uh, represent every point uh, in that cone by non-negative co uh, um, combinations of these pathways. Now, if a, re a gene is down-regulated that is specific to one of those pathways, that pathway can't be active. And uh, by eliminating that edge in the solution space, it all of a sudden now becomes a three-sided pyramid. Because to get into that other part of the space, you need that last pathway uh, active. So this is one way of mapping expression profiling data to uh, string solution spaces. The other way of doing it is just doing it straight up with the flux vector and not worry about the pathways themselves. And then you can you know, sample a solution space like we talked about uh, earlier under those constraints. Okay, um, so this gives you some sense for what we can do with chemistry, uh, crowding, uh, and so forth. Now, there are, there are many, many ways to uh, uh, impose these constraints, and we are not going to walk through them all here because you can see the mathematics can get uh, difficult. So Jenny Reed uh, put a review together at this site uh, on this slide that talks about how you can take gene expression data, protein expression data, and so forth, and impose it as constraints. So the data is taken, coded up into the network equations, and these are used as con uh, constraints on your model to shrink down the solution space. And I believe that Nate will uh, talk about some of these methods the next time uh, he is here. So many COBRA methods now available to utilize these kind of constraints in uh, uh, shrinking a solution space. Now at the end here, let me talk about the new, uh, a, well not the new, but a set of constraints that have uh, recently been explored in constraints-based modeling. And these are the uh, coupling constraints. And this relates to matching up uh, functions of the different layers uh, in the hierarchy in biology. And here's that quote to uh, Paul Nurse that I seem to like a lot. I put it into two slides already uh, in, uh, in these lectures. So um, here's uh, parsing out of a cell in terms of its abundance, uh, and complexity of its abundance. So we have one cell and maybe tens of thousands of molecules. But in between these there are layers. So from the top you can actually look at the uh, uh, major subsystems inside a cell and what proteomic allocation that requires. And you can get at that by various uh, calculations like I did for instance earlier with the ATP synthase. And Terry Hua here uh, at uh, UCSD has done uh, many, many uh, great studies uh, there in the hierarchy to look at cells you know, at that level. If you go down in the hierarchy, we may be thinking about single molecules. We'd be thinking about uh, then protein complexes, how uh, one, two, three handful of uh, protein come together, modularize. Then these often uh, perform coherent function or begin uh, uh, decipher uh, through uh, clustering or trying to figure out the regulons by knocking out transcription factors and so forth. So here there are at least five, one, two, three, four, four orders of magnitude five orders of magnitude that we can go over. So if you build models on each one of those levels, uh, we have to be able to couple them together. Say, for instance, uh, if you uh, have these 10 major subsystems you're looking at, and you know how much has to go for the ETS, or how much has to go for catabolism, and so forth, very coarse-grained version uh, or view of the proteome, you can then maybe get expression profiling data of all the genes and try to cluster and classify that. So you can see that there are maybe many clusters 
of proteins within that more coarse grain uh, function in the cell. So that's the notion of hierarchy and the need to uh, couple things. So let me give you now one specific example of how this is done. And this relates to the me model that we've talked about, where we have metabolism, the individual metabolites, and then we have the enzymes that catalyze uh, these reactions. So in the early uh, reconstruction le lectures we talked about, we just had protein. We had the reaction we placed in there, and then it was just a protein. And that protein had the GPR, was uh, related to some gene. But it was, it was a protein put there. Now, if you want to start to calculate the proteome fully uh, and the macromolecules, they, the protein now, the macromolecules now become chemical species uh, in your model. And now you have to couple together, you know, synthesize protein with this metabolic function. And in that case, you may have to parse out in detail all the binding states of a protein and treat it explicitly as a separate molecule. So now you have a reconstruction that has uh, large and small molecules in it. And it's explicitly described. And as we talked about earlier, the E matrix calculates the abundance of a protein based on its needs and its K-cat, uh, and it incorporates into that the protein all the amino acids uh, that are required to build it, and also also nuclear all the nucleotides that have to go into the transcripts and so forth. So this calls for a pretty complicated process to couple these things together mathematically. That's just illustrated in here. Um, on the top, we have these metabolic models alone that we talked about. In the bottom, we have the me model that results from coupling the M and the E matrix together. And the uh, little graphs there to the right <coughs> show what are called coupling constraints because you can set a maximum and a minimum bound on many of these processes, transcription, translation, protein assembly, and so forth. You may not be able to get equations like flux balance them fully, but you can get constraints on them. And these are called coupling constraints. And so these are constraints that go into the uh, me matrix, and they actually have a big effect on the calculation. And that's kind of illustrated in here. There are coupling constraints associated with the processes shown to the uh, right, uh, left there, transcription, translation, and some function, a protein assembly, and so forth. And to the, uh, to the right, you see an image of the stoichiometric matrix that's built for that where the uh, yellow swath are all the metabolic reactions, the green ones are associated with the uh, uh, E matrix and calculating all the macromolecules, and the orange swaths down there represent the coupling constraints. So you may end up with a very large matrix to calculate these two processes simultaneously. And what actually also happens here, which is uh, numerically challenging, is the fact that the uh, numerical values of the non-zero entries in this matrix are now spread over many orders of magnitude. <clears throat> if you just look at the yellow box, these are all stoichiometric coefficients of one or minus one, basically. A well-conditioned matrix, easy to calculate. But when you start dealing with molecules that are comprised of you know, 300 amino acids and you know, so forth and so on, all of a sudden, uh, the, uh, those numerical properties of the stoichiometric matrix and the constraints go away, and you get stuck with uh, some uh, uh, pretty challenging algorithmic issues. All right, um, so that's uh, an overview of constraints. Like I told you, it's still an overview. <laughs> you went through different classes of them, and if you want to practice them, you have to get into uh, the detailed algorithms and do the sort of thing that was illustrated in the slide from uh, Jenny Reed's uh, review. Okay, so to summarize this, uh, I think it should now be clear to everybody, so kind of fixed in your mind, that cellular functions are subject, subject to myriad constraints. There's just a lot of constraints that have to be satisfied. And in fact, sometimes you, you wonder, how is it possible <laughs> to satisfy all these constraints simultaneously? How can the cell find parameter values? How can it find the regulatory mechanisms? that allow you to find function that's consistent with all these constraints. Um, and I think somewhere in these slides I probably have a quote that says, life is, in, life is indeed improbable, because it's so hard to find that uh, uh, intersections of all these constraints. Okay, so when you can st state things mathematically, 
uh, based on the uh, uh, based on physics and chemistry, you end up with equations uh, uh, with some balances or inequalities of the constraints. Uh, we talked about this before. We need to understand that constraints can be dominant or redundant. The redundant ones you don't need, so we'd like to find the dominant ones. We also need to be aware of the fact that uh, um, uh, a dominant constraint can become a redundant constraint if you change the environment. Like for instance, when you switch a bacteria from aerobic to anaerobic growth, in the anaerobic growth state it doesn't have to express all the components of the electron transport chain and constraints on the uh, membrane occupancy may be alleviated, as an example. Um, some constraints can be derived from first principles, like the maximum uh, flux through a pathway. Uh, you can calculate them. Uh, you can sit down and calculate things, like I showed in two or three slides in here. C constraints that are just based on facts you can pull out of the literature, so those can be very useful. And then, of course, there are the biological constraints, which are the regulatory constraints, selection of numerical values of the kinetic constants that become quite interesting when we study the solution spaces. You can have the hard constraints, kind of the outer constraints, but within that set of allowable functional states, the cells will choose a state, then how do they do that and why do they do that? And if you remember from a, two or three lectures ago, we talked about the three generations of genome scale models. So as we get to the second and third generation, we start to actually be able to address these questions uh, explicitly. Okay, so that's an overview of the types of constraints we use in this COBRA field um, and kind of how they are dealt with. Undoubtedly, there will be many more of these uh, defined, uh, uh, delineated, and applied in the future.